and some of it came just a short time ago when Mrs. Harriet Clark sent me the aim and motto of this year's graduating class. And a part of that aim and motto is a phrase I just so like. It's death before dishonor. If that's not it, don't, don't correct me now, but that's how I remember it. Death before dishonor. Maybe you could live here in the United States for a long time without ever coming to a test where your faithfulness would lead to your death. I don't know if it's going to be a long time in the future, but it could have been a long time in the past that you could come without coming to that kind of test. I want to tell you two stories tonight and then share with you a Bible study. Priscilla grew up in Borneo in a jungle. And uh, her family, they made a living by helping you have those rubber gloves that you've been wearing more this year than most years of your life. Uh, she's a rubber tapper. She was as a child. That means that she, in the morning, would get up and take a lawn knife and carve a wound in a rubber tree and put a little bucket there to collect the latex sap. And they, every day they put a new wound in the tree to collect more sap, and you have to pity those trees. They get cut like that every day for their entire existence. And uh, you know, when you make your money as a rubber tapper, you don't make much. Working very hard all day long, five or six days a week, uh, all year long, you're going to be making about $200 a month. And it's hard work. And it really messes with your skin. But Priscilla, she only did that work before school and after school. And at school, she really tried. And you know, she came to her high school graduation, just like we're having here this weekend. And she had taken her exams, the Malaysia exams. And she did so well on them that Malaysia offered her a full scholarship to study medicine. Now let me tell you that in Malaysia, I mean, even here in America, doctors can earn more than average. Yeah, right? Doctors earn pretty well right here in this country. But in Malaysia, it's quite possible for a doctor to earn similar wages to what a doctor earns here in the United States. Quite possible. But rubber tappers don't earn anything like a McDonald's person earns here in the United States. So between rubber tapper and doctor is much, a much greater gap than between McDonald's and doctor. Do you follow what I'm trying to say? It's a really big jump. And her family was so excited for her because this is the ticket out of poverty, not just for Priscilla, but for the extended family and maybe even some lucky villagers. It's just a really great thing. And Priscilla went off to uni to study. And she did really well, by the way. She was excelling in her studies. She's a bright lady. But when she got to the year-end exam, and I don't know if it was the first or second year, but when she got to the year-end exam that you must take to go on to the next year, it was scheduled to be on Sabbath. And uh, that Malaysia isn't the United States. And they don't understand religious liberty there, anything like how we understand it here. And Priscilla appealed to school administrators, to teachers, to politicians. She really went through everything she could, and she could not get that test moved. Now, you know who had really encouraged her to keep the Sabbath? It had been her parents and her church family and her pastor. She really hadn't been a very spiritual girl when she was small. She went through kind of a revival when she was about 17. And this was a new thing for her. It wasn't like an old habit. It was a new habit, the Sabbath keeping. And now those same people that taught her, when she shared with them her trouble, the strangest thing happened. They all began to put pressure on her not to keep the Sabbath. The same people that were saying yesterday, keep the Sabbath, were saying, not this time. Not this time. Later, sure. Earlier, sure. But not this time. Do you understand why they might say that? Because if she doesn't take this exam, 
uh, well, it's worse than here in the States. Here in the States, if you don't keep up your grades, you can lose your scholarship going forward. But in Malaysia, you can lose your scholarship retroactively. That means when you lose your scholarship, you become indebted for all the semesters you have already studied. And the tuition for studying medicine for one year that she'd already done at least is more than she would earn in several years, excuse me, of tapping rubber. So this is why her family and her church family and her village all put pressure on her not to miss that exam. But she missed it and she lost her scholarship and she was billed retroactively for a huge sum for her. $9,000 is hard to pay off at $200 a month. Well, do you pity her? That's when I got to know her. It was after this story is when I got to know her. She came to study at our mission training school there in Malaysia, and she did really well. And uh, to make the story short enough so I can tell you a second one, she is now the director, the headmistress of our primary and secondary school in Borneo, near where she grew up in that rubber tapping area. We bought some of that rubber tapping um, uh, jungle that her family owned and now it's turned into a missionary school and in that missionary school now more than half of the enrolled 20 students are from a Muslim background more than half and a hundred percent of them are now praying like Christians all of them now and the parents were resenting it a bit you know the parents I mean the, the Muslim parents were resenting it a bit they didn't like it so well that their children were beginning to pray like Christians and pray in the name of Jesus. But then COVID-19 hit, and those, the way that those parents were getting enough money to feed their children, it dried up. And because they're illegal immigrants, the government had no support for them, and they began to go hungry. And Priscilla and her little school began taking them food each week. And you know, now one of those mothers is praying like a Christian. What I'm going to tell you about Priscilla is that the brains that God gave her, the skills that God gave her that would have made a great physician, make a great school administrator. The direction that she's gone with her life that so disappointed everyone around her didn't disappoint the angels. And the work that she's doing there is a work that has been not done by anyone else because of the serious risk involved in leading Muslims to Jesus. So that's the first story. If you were sitting here early for this meeting, you might even have heard Priscilla singing. I was playing some scripture songs over with Bluetooth over the speaker system here. The, the, children, the students there have written many scripture songs. So I was on Facebook, that evil waster of time, looking for someone to reach out to when I found a profile of a man named Musab. I wrote him, it was months before he wrote me back, but that didn't matter. When he did, we corresponded a while, then I met him in person, and we invited him to our house, and he ate Heidi's vegetarian food, and it's always best to invite people to your house before they invite you to yours, because that settles all the health issues, you know, you can just get it all straight, just right up front. If you invite them first, you have no troubles. So we invited him there, and he, he had the the fake meats or whatever my wife served him, I really don't remember. Musab brought to our first meeting a friend named Abdullah. And we began to study together Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 9. It was so exciting to them. They began to ask me questions like, well, they asked questions like, how many books are in the Bible? 
they, they were pretty excited to learn that there's an Old and New Testament, you know. They, they never grew up knowing anything about this. They're intelligent men. I mean, they're doing graduate work in IT and electronics and engineering. It's, it's not that they're low in intelligence, but they're very low in exposure to Christianity. And so they were learning so fast, so excitedly. But Musab came to a real crisis. The crisis was that he was about to graduate with honors. You might be thinking, what kind of crisis is that? You see, Musab is from Yemen, and he's studying in Malaysia. He was when the story began, when I met, got to know him. It's a great thing if you're from Yemen to be studying somewhere else, anywhere else. Wherever else it is probably has food and peace. So it's just a great thing to be somewhere else because Yemen has war and hunger. It's not a great place to be. But more than that, Musab was known to the Houthis to be opposing them before they took over the government. That is, they know him by name, and so there's a serious risk if he is, goes back to Yemen that he will be killed just for his political leanings. So it was a serious problem for Musab that he was graduating because that's the end of his student visa the end of his legal ability to stay out of Yemen. Well, you know what happened during that time, because this happened to a lot of boys that they ended up graduating, and some really nice American Yemeni ladies figured out a way to help. I don't know if you ladies would ever come up with a plan like this, like the good American Yemeni ladies did, but some of these American Yemeni ladies offered to marry these men, including Musab, sight unseen. You understand the solution? Musab marries someone he's never met who has an American citizenship, and that way he can come to the good old United States and be safe. That is a workable solution. But Musab refused. He said, that he knew that that was illegal, and he didn't want to do anything illegal. I think that's a level of morality above many people that you might know. He didn't want to do anything illegal. And, and then we talked more about how his faith might get him in serious trouble. And he said something to me that I'll never forget. He said, if I choose to become a Christian, it won't be for safety. Let me explain what he was telling me, because I told him that as a, a Christian from Yemen, there are some countries that might let him in as a refugee, you know, that might realize the danger he's in and give him a refugee status. What Musab said to me back is, if he becomes a Christian, it's not going to be to become a refugee. It's not going to be for safety. Well, Musab has become a Christian. And he has not applied for refugee status. And he did go back to Yemen. And he did find his way safely to Egypt, where he is now. And now he works for me, producing videos out of studies to lead other people to Jesus. And already he's had success. Already four individuals I know consider themselves Christians because of the work that Musab has been doing. All Yemeni citizens. And all of them are in danger. One of them, named Sahar, this is the end of that story, we're about to get to a Bible study. One of them, named Sahar, is in Yemen right now. She's 22, and she came very close to a fate worse than death in the last month. Her brother, who is her owner in Yemen, ladies in Yemen don't have their own life. They belong to their father until he's dead, and then to their husband or their brother, and their older brother, and her father was dead, and she wasn't married, so she belonged to her brother. Her brother found a Middle Eastern man, probably from Saudi Arabia, who offered to marry her, but you probably haven't heard of this bad news, but in Yemen, uh, in Ib, where she lives, uh, there's a lot of what's called tourism marriage. 
That's where a rich person from Yemen marries a poor Yemeni girl and uses her basically as a prostitute for his long vacation. And then when it's done, he discards her and goes back to Saudi Arabia. It's a common pattern there. And the reason to be worse than death isn't just because it's a marriage without any love, it's because it, she would certainly be caught there as a Christian, that she is certainly be caught and then certainly be killed. So it would be rape, 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 death, or something like that. Well, God has found a way of escape for Sahar. It hasn't happened yet, but the way has opened up. But you can know that it was her intention to be faithful to death, even if death was imminent. So death before dishonor, it's just a really great idea. I think it's the only idea that's real when it comes to Christianity. It's real. Oh, I want to tell you more stories, but I'm not going to. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Acts 4 is where the church keeps growing. Acts chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 1. And as, they, and as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Why would that bother Sadducees? Because they don't believe in resurrection from the dead. And the fact that there had recently been two resurrections was very difficult for their worldview to handle. Verse 3. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold. Uh, that's not like a chokehold we're hearing about so much recently. That's prison. They put them in jail. Unto the next day, for it was now in the evening time. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. You probably remember Acts chapter 2, that that was pretty great. But this is better. About 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Well, a beautiful long answer was given, but go to verse 10 for the crux of it. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus the Messiah of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. That was very bold. Very bold to say that. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. One of my students, Joshua, went to jail a little over a year ago. And uh, it was a beautiful experience. You can read about it at my website, BibleDoc.org. He wrote his testimony out there. Uh, many of those people there in the jail had never met a real Christian before. Uh, they became like his protectors, you know. They went, the very first day he was there, they went and bought him some fried chicken and he wouldn't eat it. And then they learned about the health message. Verse 14, And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Look down to verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it be right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you be the judge. I don't think Peter and John meant that you decide for us. But they meant you go ahead and use your reason the way we've used our reason. We've concluded that we had better obey God than you. And you just think it through if you want to tell us that it should be the other way. Verse 29. This is after they let them go. 
And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. Would you have prayed that way? If they let you go after beating you, do you think you would have gone and prayed for boldness to speak? Maybe what you would have prayed for is for a good way to escape the city, for a good path to the mountains. Because I think as Adventists, we sort of have an idea that as soon as persecution begins, we're all done. That is not right. There is some work to do after persecution begins. It's the persecution that really puts a a glowing edge on the work and makes it look real and makes it look sincere. Verse 30, by stretching forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done in the name of your holy child, Jesus. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Do you pray every day to be filled with the Holy Spirit? One of the movements that just sort of spread across the globe a little over a year ago was this uh, this booklet on 40 Days to Revival or something. I forget the name of it. But it's a whole booklet devoted to praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's just amazing to me because the book isn't highly profound. It's quite simple. But I really enjoyed it. But it was, per- it was amazing to me how it spread around the globe so quickly. Well, what happened here when they prayed for boldness? What happened is they were filled with the Spirit and they spake the word with boldness. It was a direct answer to prayer. It was what they had just prayed for. Look at chapter 5. We're going to skip the first part of chapter 5 and go all the way to verse 17. Maybe I should comment on the first 16 verses, but I think I'll do it later. Verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and they all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. Sounds like chapter 4. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. It's almost deja vu from chapter 4. But it comes out different. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Now, that's not what you think the angel is going to say to you. What you think is the angel is going to say, Get to the mountains now. But what did the angel say to them? Go to the temple and start preaching again. At verse 21, and when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought forth. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man inside." Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. They doubted whereunto this would grow. Aren't you doubting whereunto this is going to grow? Like you wonder where it's going to stop and what's going to happen, how it's going to develop? Well, this is a big movement. But what were they wondering about? They were wondering about Christianity. Where is this going? What is happening? What, what is this development? How is it going to... They were very concerned. Now when the high priest, excuse me, verse 25, then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence. I feel like reading you the whole thing, but I'm just going to tell you a bunch of what happens next. They get so angry that they decide they're going to kill them. Look at verse 33. 
And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to do what? That's the apostles. The 11 survivors are about to die. The group is so angry. And this time, God speaks through a Pharisee. He's not even on the same side as the high priest. But he gets up and says, you know, other guys led away disciples, and when they were killed, their disciples scattered. It, Jesus has been killed. Leave him alone. If you end up doing anything about it, well, it's going to go away by itself if it's not from God. But if this is from God, you might end up, you remember what he said? You might end up fighting against God, he said. And in, in something that I can tell when I read it is a miracle from heaven, they agreed with him. It doesn't make any natural sense that they would agree with him. It just had to be that God just made their brains work different than they would have preferred to happen. And they agreed and they let them go after they beat them. Look at verse 41. This is just after the beating. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus the Messiah. What a beautiful story. Do you see how the early church grew? What happens is you give them a hard time, you threaten them, you beat them, and then they keep working. You give them a hard time, you threaten them, you beat them, and then they just keep going forward. And they even rejoice about it. That worked, and the church grew. In Malaysia, about 24 years ago, there was a, a pastor that dared to give... Bible studies to the, a relative of the sultan. And uh, the sultan, that, that's, like the, that's like a king of a state, if you can sort of imagine that. You know, like if, if Arkansas had its own king, that would be a sultan in Malaysia. And um, that Adventist minister was found with his guts scattered around the inside of his church, dismembered grotesquely. Like I said, more than 20 years ago. And you know what the effect was in Malaysia? It was wonderfully powerful. It's that all the Christians, Adventist and Baptist and Pentecostal and the whole bit, realized that in West Malaysia, there are plenty of Buddhists and Hindus that we can reach. And all the evangelism for two decades has been going after the Buddhist and the Hindus, which make up 40% of the population. And there is enough. I mean, if all the Adventists in West Malaysia tried to reach out to just the Buddhists and Hindus, there's more than enough to keep them busy the whole time. More than enough. But if you'll listen to me for a minute, you'll understand something about death before dishonor. When you leave out the majority population, you virtually say something to the whole nation. You say to the whole nation, our message is not worth our life. Or else you say, we don't believe it. Or else you say, we don't care if you go to hell. You have to say one of those. Don't you know you're saying one of them? You can't get out of saying one of those. It, if I'm not bringing the gospel to you, either you're not important, or I don't believe it, or it's not worth my death. And all three of those lies are terrible for the gospel. And they don't just neutralize your ability to reach the majority, they neutralize your ability to reach the 40%. So 
So I'm going to say something to the seniors and then share a little bit more Bible study and then close. Seniors, as you make your plans for what you're going to do in life, I hope that you'll consider that reaching the Somalis is more desperate than reaching the Kenyans. You don't understand that, but let me explain that to you. Many mission trips go to Kenya. And in one of the states of Kenya, about one in four people are Seventh-day Adventist. That's the state of Kisi. And a lot of the evangelistic, evangelistic efforts that go to Kenya go to that state, Kisi. A lot of them go there. And uh, it's one in four, but the other three are, a lot of them are ex-Adventist or related to Adventist or, you know, something like that. But right there in Nairobi, you have a million immigrants from Somalia. And where it's one in four in the state of Kisi, it's not quite one in a million among the Somalis. But no one's doing mission trip to the Somalis. No one. From here in the United States, a lot of mission trips go to the Philippines. I don't know if you've gone to the Philippines, but there's a good chance some of you have. A lot of people do. It, it's kind of funny when we go to the Philippines from here because here in the United States, it's about one in 300. But in the Philippines, it's about one in 100. So you're going from a less reached to a more reached place to do your mission. So it's kind of funny. But in the very southern part of the Philippines, the southern part of Mindanao and of Palawan, the very southern tip, there's some radical Muslim areas there. Abu Sayyaf is there, which is kind of famous for doing terrible things. And you know, very few people are going on mission trips there. Like, I only know one group that's doing it, and I just love them to death. There are a group of Filipino young people about the age of the college students here that have just made it their specialty to go there, and they're going there every year. And I just give them some credit where credit is due. They're helping finish the work. I hope in your planning, well, I was, by the way, someone talked about how things are changing. Do you know this is my first time speaking to a live audience, unless you count inside a small home, in three and a half months? I mean, I have preached maybe a hundred times in those three months, all on Zoom. But this is very nice to speak to live people that I can see and that can see me at the same time and we can breathe almost the same air. It's nice to see you. But I was speaking this last week to a group in the Philippines, and what I said to them is that many Filipinos aspire to work in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and in the Emirates because, you know, in the Philippines, you might earn $100 a month, but if you go to the Middle East, you can earn many hundreds per month. It's a real improvement in your finances if you can work there. But the sad thing that happens is that the Filipinos who care least about mission and the most about money, they go. And the ones that care least about money and the most about mission, they don't. So I was speaking to the ones who care most about mission. I told them to go. Apply, not for the money, but to give those people in those dark lands that have no chances a chance. Just go ahead. Someone says, but, you, what, but what if they get killed? And what I'm saying is Acts 4 and Acts 5. In Acts 4 and 5, no one does get killed. But don't get thinking that no one will because in Acts 8 and 7, they do. But if we don't have courage, if we don't think death before dishonor, we end up living dishonorably. I told you I might come back to the 15 verses, the first part of chapter 5. Let me just tell you what's there. You can read it yourself later. It's Ananias and Sapphira. You see, they were two, that they, there were two things that they really uh, loved. One of them was honor, praise, and one of them was money. 
They loved those two. And they found a way to get both. How did they get the honor? It's by volunteering to sell their property and give the whole amount. That's how. And how did they get praise? By giving part of it only. Oh, that's how they got praise and honor, sorry. And, and how did they get the money? It's by giving part of it only, and they got to keep part of the money. And because you've read it at some point in the last few months, why don't you just tell me, how long did they get to enjoy that money? It seems like maybe not even a day. Because they both died, right? Right there. I think that they became a lesson for us. Death before dishonor. Or death after dishonor. It's kind of your choice. Either death before dishonor or death after dishonor. Ananias and Sapphira had death after dishonor. Well, it's very interesting in Revelation. You can turn there if you want, but I'm just going to talk to you about it. It's chapter 14. In chapter 14, in the three angels' messages, you have two, two sources of wrath. In the second angel's message, Babylon is the source of wrath. Babylon makes some serious threats. Did you read them in chapter 13? If you, if you don't uh, receive the mark of the beast, first of all, you can't buy or sell, and eventually you're going to die. That has to be how it goes, but when you read the chapter, it's in the opposite order. First you die, and then you can't buy or sell. But there in chapter 13, if you don't, buy, if you don't receive the mark of the beast, you have serious troubles. The wrath. But then in the third message, there's wrath to those who do receive the mark. Do you see? There's no way out. You either have the wrath of Babylon or the wrath of the Lamb. There's no way to escape both. It's impossible to get out of both. You can't know how get out of both. No way. So what happens in the end is you end up being tested over which wrath is more influential in your life. And if you're in the habit of making your temporal life the priority over eternal things, then that wrath that Babylon has is the one that relates to what you're accustomed to. Let me say that in a more simple sentence. If your plans for the future are mostly about how to have sufficient sustenance, how to get money and make it and have a good life, if this is mostly what you're aiming for in the future, Babylon knows how to use that kind of leverage more than heaven will do it. I mean, heaven could, but heaven doesn't. Could heaven withhold your food if it wanted to? Heaven really could withhold those things, right? Heaven could, it could, but it's Babylon that uses that leverage. And if that's the leverage that moves you today, it might be the leverage that moves you tomorrow. Or if what moves you today is the fact that eternity is a long time and that people are in darkness and don't have chances that need chances and they're not getting chances because people aren't taking risks to give them chances. If that's the kind of thing that moves you, if that moves you today, then I think when you read the third angel's message, that's going to move you tomorrow. So the summary of all I've said, which is all I'm saying, is that Priscilla didn't make a bad decision. She said death before dishonor, though she didn't know the words, but her life said it. And God has used her to lead people to life. Musab said death before dishonor, though he didn't know the words, and God has used him to lead people to life. Ananias and Sapphira said, we can, we can have the good stuff, and they never got to enjoy it. And I think for young people in this age that go for the good stuff, I don't know, I might be wrong about this, but I'm really afraid, young people, that you'll never get a chance to enjoy it. 
I think you just live in an age when maybe you'll never get a chance to enjoy it if you go for the good stuff. If you'd gone for it 30 years ago, maybe you'd get a chance. I don't know that today you'll get a chance. And Ananias and Sapphira didn't get one. Maybe you will. But for sure, if you say death before dishonor, you can get your good stuff later. It's better. You can rejoice even in the trouble now. It's better. And oh, it is so satisfying. So be praying for Sahar. Be praying for Musab. Those are real names. For Priscilla and her administration at the ripe old age of 25. And be praying for yourself that God will find a way to put into your heart what has come out of your lips, death before dishonor. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's, it was a blessing. We're going to now have a closing song, number 330. We will sing together 330, Take My Life and Let It Be. Why don't we stand together as we sing? Gracious Father in heaven, how grateful we are to be here tonight. We thank you for this privilege of assembling together on this Sabbath and in celebration of our children's graduation. We thank you for the message we've heard this evening and the reminder that sacrifice and And a life of dedication to you is something to aspire to. Our Lord in heaven, we ask that this Sabbath and this weekend you would inspire each of us to where we need to be and that you would make paths and plans plain 
in the minds of our sons and daughters here. We thank you for hearing us and blessing us in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so pleased you could join us here at Watchtower Hills Academy and College. And if you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Also, if you would like to support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us, and may God richly bless you.